All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Bill Shander, who is in Boston. How are you doing, Bill? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, good. And for over 20 years, Bill has had a, a Beehive, a, a full service digital agency where he really um, laser focuses on executing the vision, helping companies execute the vision. Um, and what we want to really talk about today is data visualization and storytelling or visualization storytelling. And Bill, um, we live in a world today of, you know, we've heard of big data and data flowing in from everywhere and let's get more data and lots of data and everything. And, and people are getting overwhelmed. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's such a cliche, big data, more data, measure everything. You know, you can't manage what you don't measure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but humans need visuals. Humans need a way to interpret that data. And looking at tables and numbers just doesn't work. Um, really, research proven. It's not just me saying it. So data visualization allows us to see what the numbers are saying, um, and it even allows data analysts to see what it's saying to them, never mind communicating it to an audience. So yeah, it's the only way we can handle the influx and the, uh, the ever-growing amount of data we're faced with. Yeah, and that actually on 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 the you know, us being a software company with Pipeline or CRM, that's actually where we we started our process was everything around visualization because of salespeople being overwhelmed with tables and all of that, needing to see and understand data quickly because they're very busy. So, yeah. um, can you talk to me a little bit about uh, the idea of um, visualizing thought leadership? That's something that you talk about. What what do you mean by visualizing thought leadership? Um, well, you know, thought leadership, real thought leadership is research based uh, information. You know, thought leadership is such a, another sort of buzzword that's sure. uh, really improperly used in most cases. Real thought leadership is research driven ideas. Um, so like the consulting firms do real thought leadership. They will do primary research. They'll, they'll ask people questions. They'll look at data, et cetera. And then they need to share it out. That's the leadership part where they actually lead with ideas. And generally that is communicating data and therefore you need visualization to do a good job of it. So it's not, it's not sort of a conceptual idea of visualizing thought leadership. It's literally visualizing the data that the thought leadership is built upon. And why is that? Uh, that seems like a quite a difficult thing for a lot of people. Obviously why it keeps you very busy, a difficult um, thing for a lot of people to be able to do is take it from data to visualization to something that can be consumed. That seems to be a very difficult process for a lot of people. It is, you know, so, you know, in addition to doing project work, I teach data visualization a lot. I have uh, courses on LinkedIn learning and uh, I also teach workshops for companies. And what I've found is that whether I'm um, teaching workshops to marketing communications people mm -hmm. or to data analyst types, um, they both struggle with it. And for sort of two opposite reasons, data analyst types are so neck deep in the data, the numbers that they forget that, oh, right, there are humans that need to understand what this is all about. I've got to communicate. And marketing analyst types remember to communicate, but they get so freaked out and intimidated by the numbers that they sort of lose their ability to communicate because they're sort of overwhelmed by this mathy type stuff. <laughs> um, and so for different reasons, but it is the same problem. And, you know, the, the first technique I always teach is, you know what, for a moment, forget the data. Right. What is the important thing that is that the data is telling you? So, you know, in a sales scenario, right? So mm -hmm. the data is telling us that our sales have gone down for the last three quarters, which, by the way, coincides with, you know, cutting salaries of our salespeople. Okay, that's a reasonable scenario. So what's the story behind those numbers? Before you worry about communicating the data, what's the story? Well, the story is salaries cuts are correlated to sales dropping. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, let's figure out how to actually visualize the data and communicate the data behind that story. So story comes first is the simple idea. Yeah. So basically, behind every every set of data, there should be a story or else the data doesn't isn't really helping you, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's really that simple. You know, if you think about looking at a table of numbers, unless you're a real, you know, data analyst mm -hmm. type, um, they literally mean nothing. Mm -hmm. And even if you create a chart, all right, so there's a chart of a line going like this. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. You know, it still means nothing. Oh, that line represents that sales are going down. That means something. But if that's the story, that's the the message. Um, it's not the data in a vacuum. 
Yeah. And we as humans, right? I mean, as I said at the beginning, I mean, we're getting overloaded by so much data and we can only consume a certain amount. So if you if we want to communicate something that's, you know, data based or data driven, we have to take that into account that we have to present it in such a way that it's consumable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of studies about data visualization, what works, what doesn't work. Um, a lot of studies in a related field about visual perception, how humans see things. Um, and really, they all come to the exact same conclusion that less is more. Mm -hmm. You have to strip away the noise. Um, you have to take away all the nonsense, all the visual distraction. And there are very simple techniques you can do in data visualization to do that, you know, reduce the number of things you are showing and and or reduce contrast. So right. make everything gray, a really light gray, except for that one line you want everyone to see that a giant bright red thick line. Make sure all your labels, which should be very few of them, are very light and gray, except for that one label on the big giant honking bubble that should be really bright and bold. And, right. You know, it's about drawing the eye to what people, what you want people to be looking at, essentially. Yeah, because if you think about it, if you go to a modern art gallery, right? I mean, generally speaking, it's very minimalist. They're very minimalist, so that they are, and very spatial, so that they allow yeah. you focus on the pieces on display. That's it. You know, you you want to actually draw the eye to something, and that's. You know, one of the problems that data analysts have um, when they're visualizing data is they say, you know what, people need to see all the data. I'm mm -hmm. going to put every single data point on there and I'm going to label every single one of them because they're all important. <clears throat> but when you tell your audience that everything's important, really you're telling them that nothing's important. Right. And yeah, art galleries understand that, no, I want you to look at the art, mm -hmm. the wall not the star and in, in my world the data is the star mm -hmm. so um so that's that's an interesting point it's an interesting point that you raise there about the fact that uh you know we're we get so excited about the data that we want to present all of it and what you're saying is uh you have to really <laughs> understand which is the which part of the data is the most critical and present that kind of in almost in isolation so that you can consume that piece of data yeah, and even when you have a complicated uh, chart, let's say I, I want to I want you to to communicate a lot of things. My favorite example is this. So, I want to communicate um, survey data. Right. I asked a thousand people, do they like you know love, like, neutral, kind of dislike, or hate something? Mm -hmm. I could say, and it's a score of waiting one through five. Let's say, I could just tell you that. 67% of people scored it, uh, you know, a four or above. That's in isolation. That's focusing you on one sure. number. And that's okay. That's good. But there's a lot, a lot of times there's like enough nuance in the full data set that I do want to show you all thousand data points. Mm -hmm. I can do that in something called a dot plot where along the line, I'm going to show you all thousand answers. 500 people said this, four said this. And then the other, you know, 496 sure. were spread out, you know, pretty evenly this way. Seeing that giant cluster of people over here is informative and helpful and yeah. it's worth seeing. And then I can, of course, have a big red line that says about the 67% who felt, you know, above X. And so mm -hmm. you can show complexity and a lot of information as long as using design, making sure all those thousand dots are very faded back and translucent. And but I can still give you the gist of the massive thing without overwhelming you. So design plays a very critical role in, in helping that process. Yeah, and I was going to say when you were going through that example is that it's very interesting because once upon a time, data analysis and say graphic design or graphic representation would have been they probably wouldn't even have been sitting in the same building, probably not even in the same zip code, right? Yeah. So, but but from what you're saying is they are now two critical sides of the same coin they absolutely are and it's interesting because there's a big debate in the data visualization community although i think the debate is now settled mm -hmm. um but the debate started with edward tufty who in the 80s said uh talking about what he calls chart junk which is a chart that has design okay mm -hmm. so a chart that is not just the most minimal visual sure. he said that uh essentially chart junk um, the phrase he used was shows contempt for both the data and the audience. So he was saying essentially design is worthless. And it's been proven by research and by the rest of the community. Well, no, that's nonsense. Like mm -hmm. it actually is respect and empathy for your audience that yeah. design matters. You have to make things beautiful. Aesthetics matter. There's another study that was done that found that even when you choose a chart type, 
that on paper should not perform as well as like say bar charts. Mm -hmm. um, if it's beautiful, if people really love it, they'll spend more time looking at it and learn how to read it and their accuracy of understanding is not affected at all. Mm. So aesthetics matter, design matters, and yeah, it's a very different world from what it was 10, 15, 20 plus years ago. Yeah, and, and I think part of it too is, I mean, we've all, you know, with smartphones and all of that, we've all become almost trained to be these aesthetic critics, right? You know, we know what we like. We, we I mean, you see people from all generations of backgrounds discussing the aesthetics of something, which would never have happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Absolutely. I mean, in UX, you know, the user experience and the visual design of all these apps and tools that we're using across the board are beautiful and easy to use, et cetera. And so we've been trained to appreciate and require good design. So yeah, we, we've been trained both to think differently about it and talk about it, and also to expect it in every you know everywhere we go, essentially. Yeah. So those are the, those people who are producing data, doing data analysts, and and uh, you know getting to and creating you know great pieces of of research or, or data need to understand that uh, it's all very well creating the data, come up with the data, but if you can't presented in a way that we want to consume it it's a waste of time yeah i mean the phrase i always use you know if a tree falls in a forest right you know no one hears it mm -hmm. so if if you the work you do doesn't get communicated it is serves literally no purpose right. if it gets communicated but no one can understand <laughs> it etc it's the same thing right mm -hmm. so yeah good design matters um there was actually a study done a couple of years ago that found uh, looking at job listings, the number one skill that uh, that hirers were looking for for data analysts, mm -hmm. the number one skill was communications. Right. So, yeah, the people in that world need to understand that. And design is, is now part of that. Yeah, and because it's it, just taking that point, once upon a time, it would have been you would have had your data analyst and then you would have almost had somebody else to explain what the data analyst was saying to you. Yeah. <laughs> but it still worked that way. And that's okay. Like, you know, listen, I mean, my work is doing that. Like, you know, I work with companies where they have data people and I help make it beautiful and community, you know, understandable, et cetera. And that's not a terrible thing when it is separated, as long as those two can talk to each other. Right. Um, because you have someone who's really good at translating. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's still a challenge that, but that I think over time that will be, uh, it'll be more ingrained in the data analyst types to, to work that way. Yeah. So you've been doing this for a while now. Uh, so what is, what is, what has changed over the last number of years, do you think? And, and why is, you know, the work that you're doing, you know, becoming even more important? Um, it's becoming more important because there's just more and more data. Mm hmm it's becoming more important because our society is trusting sources of information and institutions and facts less and less. Mm -hmm. um, what's changed is the tools have changed tremendously. Attitudes about design, as we were just talking about, and an appreciation for things like that have changed tremendously. Um, you know, the, and really also the world of data visualization has just skyrocketed, right? The New York Times, Guardian, NPR, ProPublica, all these publications are creating incredible data stories, beautiful things. So kind of like our apps and our phones taught us that to appreciate different stuff, mm -hmm. these people are teaching us to expect different data communications. And so it's just, you know, the bar is just being raised and every organization needs to sort of realize that and, and deal with it. Yeah, and and so where do you what do you see the where do you see the future of data going? Because as we said at the beginning, you know, big data is a great buzzword and lots of data and all of that. But uh, at the end of the day, it's really about for me. It's always been about small data because it's about the data that's relevant to you in what you're doing. Yeah, you know, I think that um, you know, really, if you if you take a step back, businesses have been pretty data focused, mm -hmm. really for fifty plus years, right? right. You know, businesses mm -hmm. have always taken data seriously. Um, there's more of an appreciation for communications and visual expression of data now. There are more tools out there that more easily connect you to all of your data sources and easily generate visual and uh, interactive experiences from mm -hmm. tools like Flow and ClickView and Power BI. So I think that where it's going is that it will be easier uh, and more common for smaller and smaller and less sophisticated businesses 
to produce materials that are less crappy. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, to use a technical uh, term. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I think that's the primary change. I think it's just going to be more ubiquitous and better quality over time. But that doesn't solve the main problem which is that, okay, so people are going to be generating a whole bunch of dashboards mm -hmm. and things that maybe look a little better, but they're still not capturing the main idea. And that's where the communication design thinking really comes in, where people have to think about, what am I really trying to say with this data? Why am I even doing this stupid dashboard in the first place? If we can help people get there, then they'll do a better job as these tools make it easier to do that stuff. Do you think there's a danger, though, that um, – that we've become a little bit more superficial, you know, short attention span so that maybe we, you know, see something that's, uh, we see a piece of data that's, you know, visually beautifully presented to us and we just go, ooh, and we take that data point and we, and we just don't really dive in behind it or contextualize it or whatever. And then we just go off and use it because it just resonated with us because it was pretty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no question that happens. Um, and that's actually part of what I'm saying. It's not necessarily the reason I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. Part of my comment about the survey data before. Great. So like 64% of people say X, Y, Z. Yeah. Yeah. As, you know, if it's in a beautiful infographic with a big picture of a, you know, kitty cat, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to remember it. I'm going to quote it to all my friends, you know, improperly, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but when you show the full data set, you can, you can bring complexity and uh -huh. context and nuance and yet still hammer that one point home then I think you're bringing more value to an audience. And that's our job to communicate with integrity. Um, yes, to make things beautiful, but also to make them to make them real and to be authentic with our data. Yeah, I love what you said there, because I think that's a really key point is the way you're saying like you're presenting all of the data, but presenting it in such a way that it's still consumable. It still gets the key point across, but it gets it across in a context, right, as opposed to Absolutely. in isolation. Yeah, the term I used, just started using recently was you have to be a data fiduciary. It's like you're, you're responsible to the truth in the data, mm -hmm. but you're a communicator. And that means you have a goal. You're trying to get information out there, and therefore you also are responsible to please an audience. Um, and that, that's not always pleasing them with the, the data itself may be displeasing, right? Yes. Sales are down. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. But let's please them visually. Let's make them happy to consume this information, even if it might be bad news, because you're not going to lie with your data. You're going to tell the truth. Yeah, that's a great place to finish, uh, Bill. <laughs> um, love the conversation. So before we go, uh, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can learn more about you and what you do? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, like I said before, I do. Uh, I work with clients on data visualization projects, but more and more these days, uh, I teach data storytelling and visualization workshops. And so... When I'm uh, hired by an organization, and I've worked with organizations like Starbucks, the International Monetary Fund, uh, Dun & Bradstreet, many, many other really good brands, um, they go to my website, rockthevizcom.com, um, and you know you can look about uh, look up my workshops there, and uh, you know I teach exactly what I'm talking about here today: how to come up with really good ideas, how to visualize them compellingly, and uh, always be truthful with your data. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. And and we certainly on the Pipeline or CRM side completely endorse this as that has always been and remains to this day our, our main focus and competitive differentiators, visualizing data, making it easy for people to understand and act upon uh, accurate data. So, Bill, yeah. thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline or CRM. And see you all again for another Expert inter Insight interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.